um, I'm going to uh, finish this, this uh, superficial overview of the heliosphere, heliophysical system, the heliosphere, uh, with um, the last question and the three questions we asked. Um, why does the Earth and other planets, and now, now in addition to our usual eight planets, or nine, as you've heard, uh, we're, we can also ask the same question of planets all through the solar system, the exoplanets that we're able to see. Why would they have an ionosphere? And we have an ionosphere. Why do they have magnetospheres? Uh, and uh, actually, this is one of those things, like the last time, where the answer basically raises the question you just answered. That is, they have a, an ionosphere because of the sun, the x-rays and the EUV from the sun's corona. And of course, you'd say, well, why does the sun have corona? We already heard a lecture on that. It has a corona because it has a magnetic field. And then you ask, why does the sun have a magnetic field? And we all know about the sun's dynamo. So, so we'll just finish up by saying, well, so what if it has a corona? So what if it has EUV and x-rays? Uh, what does that do to create a an ionosphere? And to start with, I want to review what our atmosphere looks like in a cartoon kind of picture of the atmosphere. Um, how many people? So there are among heliophysicists people who specialize in this. I am not one, um, but I do live on Earth, so I kind of have an idea of the atmosphere. How many people here have, have at least heard these terms like stratus, stratopause and mesopause? OK. So basically, this, these are terms that refer to the uh, temperature structure of the Earth's atmosphere. So temperature, of course, <clears throat> we want to plot height vertically. So that means temperature runs horizontally uh, in Kelvin. Uh, so here is our nice uh, boulder 200, and it looks like it's only 270 Kelvin here. Uh, and it falls off as you go up. Um, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to hike around here in the mountains, go up to Rocky Mountain National Park. But as you go up, it will get cooler. Uh, if you go way, way up, it, it, you get to the tropopause, you get to the top of the atmosphere, pretty much where, uh, well, it's a little bit above where mm, Mount Everest peaks, but you know it's cold up there. Uh, yeah, and, that, and that's out 200 Kelvin. Then it turns around and then comes and then drops again, and then goes way back up. So the turnaround, the center of that is the stratopause. So this is a stratosphere where the temperature increases as you go up, rather than decreasing. And it falls off again, and then it goes back up. We actually saw in our plot of the sun's atmosphere, not as many little turnarounds, but there were turnarounds. What does that mean when the temperature has a sort of a peak, right? If you read, if you turn this sideways, this is a high, this is a peak in the temperature. OK, in this case, it's, it's, this is where the absorption of UV. In general, a peak means there's heating going on there, right? Energy is being added at that point, And it's conducting away in both directions. Yeah, so in this case, that's going to be that. In fact, there's the nice little cartoon. And I, I played around quite a bit with uh, scaling on PowerPoint. This is a plot from volume three. This shows in this axis wavelengths, uh, sorry, the wavelength of light. And this is the vertical height axis. And in color is the amount of energy being deposited by the sun's spectrum. And here's the sun's spectrum. We saw this uh, a little bit plotted. Uh, before, when we were talking about the sun, the sun, uh, here is a black body curve. This is a this is a semi log axis. So this is wavelength in this direction, um, and this is the amount of energy coming out of the sun. So you can see down in this range below a thousand uh, angstroms. Sorry, I have to do this in angstroms. Uh, there's very little uh, radiation. It goes way up over here, and here's where we get to the visible. Okay, so we have a lot of energy in this range, and it all makes it to sort of 40 kilometers or so and is absorbed. That's what's causing the stratopause. That's what's, that's what's creating the stratosphere. We have this deposition of all this ultraviolet radiation. Now, radiation shorter than that doesn't even make it down to here. 
Uh, here's one of my favorites, 171 angstroms, 17 nanometers. It's absorbed way up there at 100 kilometers, which tells you if you happen to have developed a uh, taste for 171 angstrom images, where do you have to go to, to take those pictures? You have to go to space. You're not taking them from the ground. None of that energy makes it to the ground. So this, this curve is very important in understanding the deposition of these short wavelengths. And then that actually creates the structure of the atmosphere. Um, you can see this sort of 3,000 angstroms and below is really getting, getting nailed, not making it to the ground. Uh, OK, so and I should remind you that it's these short wavelengths. Right? If, if, it were a, if the sun was only emitting at a black body temperature of 5770, there would basically be nothing, zero. It just falls off so fast here. Uh, all of this is being created by the corona and also the transition region, which is that steep transition from the, the, the bottom upward. So I want to just go into a little bit of the physics, the basic physics, about why this curve sort of looks this way and what the consequences of it are. Um, so I want to think about an individual photon. So it has some wavelength. It's coming in. Maybe it's not coming in from straight overhead because it's not noon on the equator. right? It's coming in at some angle. Uh, for some reason, they write this angle as a Greek letter chi. Uh, but it comes in at this angle, and a, it's a single photon. And it may get absorbed. We express the the absorption in terms of a cross section, right, has units of centimeters squared. And that is a basically, if you think of a cylinder with that cross sectional area. Oh, shit. Yeah. All right, sorry. Get a little bit of Green Day playing the Simpsons. Uh, a probability, so essentially, <clears throat> this. The, the uh, cross-sectional area times the number density of absorbers integrated along a path. This is a dimensionless number known as the optical path. And it's the average number of absorbers in that length. If I integrate from infinity or integrate from somewhere far, far away to a position, that integral tells me the average number of absorbers, right? So basically, it's the area of a cylinder cross-sectional area times length times the number, it's the volume of the cylinder, times the number of things per volume. So when I hit one absorber, I die, right? I get absorbed. Yes. OK, will I go exactly to tau equals 1 and be absorbed every single time? Right? If you have 50% chance of flipping heads, what is if you, flip, if you flip the coin twice, you're guaranteed to get heads once, right? Is that how it works? Anyone who says yes, I, I want to meet you afterwards. I'm going to play some, play some games. No, it's probabilistic, right? So it tells you that the expectation is one. The distribution is essentially an exponential distribution. That's the way these kinds of, of probabilities work. So the probability is e to the minus the optical depth. So if you go an optical depth far less than 1, an optical depth in this case is a dimensionless number, far less than 1, then probably you're not going to be absorbed. Far more than 1, e to the minus a big number, it's going to be a very small probability. That's the probability of you surviving. right? You, you, you might be that, that 1 in a zillion that actually makes it through, but that's a very small probability. OK. So the last thing in trying to unravel this is the number of absorbers, that is the number density of molecules or atoms, molecules in the atmosphere, falls off exponentially with height. This is approximate, but it's pretty good. Uh, the the uh, length scale over which it falls by E is known as the uh, density scale height. Um, and so what you really have to do is do this integral here. And this integral is written along the length of the, the path of the photon. So we have to correct so we can maybe write it as a function of z. So I need a little trig with the, with the secant of this angle. Uh, I have this n0 I can pull outside the integral. And then I have this integral 
of an exponential, and I can do that. And that tells me that tau falls, increases exponentially from some height, from some position z tau, where tau is equal to 1. Okay? So the probability of surviving decreases, or sorry, the, the optical depth decreases exponentially. This is one of my favorite things because I'm the kind of guy who likes these kinds of weird functions. That means the probability of surviving to a given height, z, is the exponential of an exponential. It falls off very, very fast. e to the minus e to the minus z over h. And then the length scale within the exponential is that pressure scale height. Anyone just happen to know? Marika, you've been in at least one class with me where we talk about the, the scale height of the Earth's atmosphere, even though you're not an atmospheric physicist. Order of magnitude. Ten kilometers, yeah. I think, I think it's usually quoted as sort of like eight, which oddly enough is the height of Mount, Mount Everest, I think, is nine kilometers. Um, so, so yeah, you, when you're there, the density of air has fallen off by one over E, which is why it's a good thing to bring oxygen with you. Um, so yeah, at least low down, this is falling off the inside, this inner exponential is falling off by one over E every 10 kilometers, say, and then that's inside an exponential. All right, so that gives us the probability of survival of our photons. Um, and so here's, here's sort of a plot of, of this. This is the probability. Here's the probability 1. This is for a cross-section. And I haven't told you what that cross-section is, but these are some pretty typical numbers, 10 to the minus 17 centimeters squared. Molecules are small, right? So it's going to be a small number. 10 to the minus 20 centimeters squared, 10 to the minus 23 centimeters squared. And here is here's the height, here's the pressure you're going to be at. And here's your probability. And you can see it just cuts off like a knife. right? If you have this big cross-section, you ain't making it past 150 kilometers. right? You'll be, you'll be lucky to make it to 100, 150, sort of halfway, or 50-50 shot. 140, almost nothing. And, and you get the idea. So this is, this is a really fast fall off for the probability of survival. Here are the actual cross-sectional areas we do experience as a function of wavelength. And here's a more detailed plot. I believe this comes from the textbook, showing you why photons are of different wavelengths are being absorbed. And it really has to do with what the atmosphere is made of and how easily those different molecules or atoms or ions absorb, uh, absorb light. So down here, sort of around what you call the the classic ultraviolet, the absorption cross-section is very small. And uh, as you get shorter and shorter, there are these molecules that will start to try to grab hold of the, of the photons and give you a pretty high cross-section for absorption. This is ozone. And you often hear that. The ozone layer screening us from ultraviolet, that is the main thing that's absorbing these photons around 2,500 angstroms. It is the ozone. But by the time you get down to 2,000 angstroms, those things are just too loosely constructed. And it's the actual oxygen O2 molecules that are doing a lot of the absorption. Up here, O2 molecules are doing the absorption. Here's lime and alpha. There is a little bit of hydrogen in the atmosphere. So that's going to grab onto those photons. And over here, what we're going to get is the photons have so much energy that they will actually ionize nitrogen or oxygen or N2 or O2, they will hit the atom, kick off an electron, and they're absorbed. Okay, So this very short wavelength, and so this shows you the ionization threshold to ionize O2, you need to have a wavelength this long or shorter. Right? You have more energy as you get shorter. If you have more energy than that, you will ionize the uh, oxygen and then have energy to spare. Maybe it'll give the electron a little extra kick. OK? So this is, you know, this is, in principle, a very complicated calculation. But someone has done it. And this is the cross-section. And now I've just basically put it into that form. And you see roughly the same curve that we were seeing before. This is why stuff is absorbed where it is. Right? Here's that curve. 
And then here's the structure that we were seeing before. So now you sort of see this is, this is where you would be absorbed 50% chance with this cross-section, this cross-section, this cross-section. These are the different cross-sections. Sorry, there they are. OK, so, so in a way, this structure now starts to make sense. It just has to do with the cross-section for absorbing photons. And the short photons, the short wavelength photons, are the ones that don't make it, that have very high cross-sections. And the reason is there's so many things out there that are willing to absorb them. And they basically die trying, right? They, they get ionized. But that's a, that's a pretty effective way of absorbing a photon. All right, um, so once you absorb this photon, you have taken on its energy. So this is actually the, the energy flux, the energy, sorry, here is the energy flux, which is the energy per, the ergs per square centimeter per second uh, coming in. And that is the amount that comes in from infinity times the probability that those photons have made it to that height, right? So we originally, at infinity, the sun is emitting these photons. And near the sun, there's pretty much nothing to absorb them. Then they start entering the Earth's atmosphere. And their probability of survival goes down as the height goes down. So this is the amount making it to a given height. We've already worked out what this probability is. It's this exponential of an exponential. So if I just take the derivative of this, this tells me how much energy didn't make it from one height to another. And now I get even, even more fun. I get to take the derivative of an exponential of an exponential. And that's what this is. Uh, and so this tells you where that energy is being absorbed. So here's that knife edge fall off. And basically, it's telling you that the energy is really absorbed, peaked right there where, that, where the probability falls to 0 very rapidly. Uh, and you can't really see it on these scales, even though I made it a logarithmic scale. When you're dealing with an exponential of an exponential, you might need to take a log of a log to really see any structure. Uh, otherwise, this looks like a knife edge. But it actually does fall off more gradually on the upside than the downside. Uh, and this goes, this cool function goes by the name of a Chapman layer. It is the simplest picture of how energy is being deposited into the atmosphere, uh, understandable by even an astrophysicist. OK. So that sort of tells you for this wavelength, for this wavelength where we know what the, the cross-section for absorption is, we're seeing that sort of fall off here. That's why it's so sharp at the bottom, right? Remember the color starting with white and yellow. That's the most, the highest rate of energy deposition. That's the peak in this. And then as you go up from that, it falls off from yellow to red to magenta to blue, right? Gradually over that height. So this is, this is not reality, but this is a very sophisticated model. And this is me taking the derivative of an exponential of an exponential. Uh, and this blue curve here, this is I infinity. This is the amount of energy coming from the sun as a function of wavelength. Right? And there, there you sort of have that level milliwatts per square meter per nanometer. That's known as the solar irradiance. OK. so. So what? We've deposited energy in our atmosphere. What does that buy us? Well, excuse me. So um, one thing that I want to take note of is there were these places where the absorption was basically creating ions. It was kicking out electrons. So one of the things that this energy deposition is going to do is start creating ions and electron pairs flying around. So here is a little chemistry kind of diagram. We have a nitrogen molecule up here. It gets ionized, creates N2. Uh, and if, uh, let's see. Anyway, uh, these, this is another ion that's basically uh, being created out of oxygen. Uh, and the oxygen and the O can join together to form. I don't know why N2 and O2 are are joined together. I am not, in case you heard differently, I'm not an, a chemist. Uh, but the important thing is we have all these rates. 
we know once we ionize these things, we know how much of everything there is and where they're going to go. And so in this region where we're doing the ionization, we are creating a density of electrons. And here is a plot of the electron density in the ionosphere. And actually, there's four curves here, night and day. Nick, take note of this. This is night. This is day. This is Mauna Kea. This is Mauna Loa. Okay. Or Haleakala. All right. Uh, yeah, and so obviously we have the sun up creating these electrons during the day. But how come it's not zero at night? Nothing's being ionized at night. Why doesn't, why doesn't the ionosphere just go away? Why don't these electrons just go away? Exactly. There's a time involved. They need to find a positive ion and latch onto it. Not as easy as you might think. And in fact, why do you suppose there's very little difference up here and there's a much bigger difference down low? So if you go up high, now the difference isn't so great. More time to find a partner, exactly. You know, the, the, the encounters are very infrequent up here. And so the, the amount of time might actually be so long that by the time you're, you found one, it's day again. And you get re so, so the deeper down you go, the longer, uh, sorry, the, the uh, less time it takes and the more time you have. And this is a log plot. So, you know, basically you've fallen off by and or, uh, two orders of magnitude when you're low down. Um, and you can see below a certain depth, they're just, the photons don't make it. So you're, fight, you're fighting those two effects. So that sort of simple picture has given us a lot of the, a lot of the structure of the ionosphere we expect. And let's just work into this, uh, into some, uh, some crude numbers, what we think these, this rate is going to play into it. Uh, so we've already figured out the amount of energy per unit volume uh, coming into, well, we figured out the, the number of photons, the flux of photons. Um, and what we need is not just a cross-section for absorption, but we need a cross-section for ionization. So the cross-section of ionization is sigma ionization. This is the number of things you can ionize, and this is the flux of photons. And again, the flux of photons is this probability, the number of photons, and, and now instead of energy, I'm working in terms of photons, uh, coming in from the sun, and then the probability that they made it here. And this is the number of things you can ionize. Okay, So here's what the electron density should look like. It's this cross-section, and then this exponential of an exponential kind of thing. Then it, it doesn't just build up electrons forever and ever. And of course, when it builds up electrons, it's building up ions at exactly the same rate. But we tend to just talk about the electrons. Um, they recombine. And the rate of recombination requires that the electron meet an ion and then form a neutral atom. And so the rate at which that's going to happen is proportional to the number of electron, the number density of electrons times the number density of ions. Okay, and then some rate coefficient. So it goes up as n e squared. So here we have this, this complicated function, but this is basically the number of electrons, and this is the number of electrons squared. So basically there's a, a value of n e at which those two things will happen at the same rate. Okay, the number of electrons goes as a square root of this Q, this production rate, divided by the recombination rate. Okay, so that, that basically gives us what we should expect in steady state when the electrons and are being produced and destroyed at exactly the same rate. Um, so here's another plot. This, this is hours local time. I think this is at Haystack, which is a, a telescope in Massachusetts that produces a lot of ionospheric data. So over here on the right, we're seeing the same 
plot I showed you before. This is the number density of electrons. Uh, this, is the, this is the curve for day. This is the curve for night. And you see that it has that structure there. Here's the number density, again, uh, as a function of time. And you get to see in color here, and I didn't put a color bar, but this is a large number density of electrons. This is a small density, everything in between. Uh, and I basically took this plot here and sliced it down noon and down midnight. And there's the noon curve. And there's the midnight curve. You see the noon curve goes through its peak right there. The midnight curve peak a little bit higher right up there. Uh, and then I took three altitudes uh, somewhere down here. I don't think I said what it was. It seems to be about 80 kilometers or so something like uh, 250 kilometers and something like 800 kilometers and plot it. And you see that the 250 kilometer one, it really does have this very big peak when the sun is out. There's a, a high density there. There's a very high probability that these electrons uh, recombine. And so the electron density goes up in the middle of the day and falls off. Uh, when we get up to 250 kilometers, the number density goes much higher. I, I helpfully put these little curves here, so you see that and that. Uh, it goes up much higher, but the amount of modulation is lower because there are fewer things to combine with, but the probability of photons making it to that height is higher than down there. So you're getting a lot more production, and therefore it has to be balanced by destruction. And when you get up to the 800 kilometer level, things don't change very much at all. This is the same story I was telling before. You just don't see uh, that many things that you can combine with. So you tend to stay in place. But that, there is still that equilibrium then. The mean value across here is basically that same square root of, of the production rate divided by the destruction rate. OK. Uh, so here, overall, is a picture of the electron density that I've been showing, it goes up sort of to about 10 to the 6 electrons per cubic centimeter uh, and then falls off. Right? We've, all see, we've seen this picture before. As I said, every one of these electrons is produced by ionizing something. So there are ions around. And actually, here we have each of the ion species in solid. So we have the oxygen. Just single oxygen plus hydrogen, helium. We have nitrogen ox oxide. Um, in the dashed, this actually shows you just the density of our good old friend nitrogen. This is the majority of the electron, of the uh, uh, molecules in our atmosphere falling off. Remember, it falls off exponentially. Uh, there's, oh, sorry about this color table. Um, someone else plotted this, so I, I shouldn't have to apologize for it. This is our, our oxygen, which is always so important for us, molecular oxygen. And here's atomic oxygen. This is basically oxygen that has uh, lost its partner and exists without another oxygen. And it falls off much more slowly. This is helium, part of the lecture I would give about uh, the solar eclipse had to do with the fact that helium was discovered in a solar eclipse and discovered by a spectral line. And why do you suppose they called it helium? Right. It was from the sun. They thought it only existed on the sun. It was actually decades later that they found any on Earth. They thought it was existed only in the sun. And then the next part of the story from the corona is the element coronium, which we all know about, right? You'll have to ask me over coffee about coronium. Uh, anyway, uh, it does exist on the Earth. It's, it's pretty rare, and it falls off like this. Um, let, let's focus on those first, just to, just to make sure we understand the, what's going on here. This is the exponential fall off, but we have different scale heights with which these things, different things fall off at. And does anyone know why they fall off at different rates like that? What? Masses, yeah. yeah. The height, the scale height that I, I just called h is actually the temperature divided by the mean molecular mass. 
So you can just work that right out. And sure enough, if you have molecular nitrogen, it's 28 protons and neutrons. And it has a scale height of 43 kilometers. Uh, oxygen here uh, has a scale height of 38 kilometers. So it falls off with a, a shorter scale height. Uh, and that's why atomic oxygen is so prevalent. It has 16. So it has a, a scale height that's much smaller than all of those. And you can see helium here. Sure, it doesn't seem to be very plentiful down here, but it doesn't fall off very rapidly at all. So, uh, so these things are falling off. But the, th the thing to actually note also here is if you look at any of these neutral species, they're a thousand, yeah, a thousand times more abundant than the electrons. So there's this ionosphere, but really it accounts for only 0.1% of all the stuff. The rest of the stuff is neutral. So the ionosphere is a different plasma than we're used to dealing with in the sun. Uh, it, is, it is mostly neutrals. I mean, mostly by a long shot. But of course, it's electrically active. And so um, that's, that's what makes it so interesting. It's a conducting, electrically conducting fluid. Uh, the neutrals you can think of as an entirely separate fluid. That's the fluid we live in, we breathe. Uh, and it's the, it's the destruction and creation of the electrons that couples the two fluids. That is to say, just because you're neutral now doesn't mean you will always be neutral. You could get ionized, and then you will be part of the ion fluid, and then you'll recombine and be part of the neutral fluid. And that whole time you're carrying, say, your momentum with you. Right? This ionization doesn't do much with your momentum. So the momentum of the neutral fluid and the momentum of the ion fluid are very similar because or the momentum per unit mass are very similar because they're changing places all the time. OK. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways we actually really discovered the ionosphere was when we started to work with radios. The, the uh, electron fluid, even, even though there are not that many electrons and ions, they make a good conductor. And like all good conductors, they want to create zero electric field. Right? They want to zero out the electric field. However, they have to do that by moving the electrons and the ions around. And there's sort of a natural frequency that electrons and ions will move around, known as the plasma frequency. Have you all seen the plasma frequency? It actually comes up in, in basic e and M when you're dealing with metals. The plasma frequency is the number density of electrons inside the square root the mass of the electron, everything else is a constant of nature. So it's basically about 10 kilohertz times the number density expressed in centimeters squared per sec uh, centimeters to the minus 3 uh, gives you the plasma frequency. So when we have a ionosphere with a numbered an electron density of, of 10 to the 6, this is basically going to be Square root of 10 to the 6 is 10 to the 3, 10 megahertz. So what that tells you is the ionosphere is able to zero out the electric field. No elect it's a perfect conductor. As long as you're trying to change the electric field at frequencies below a mega 10 megahertz. Right? Anything below that, and it's going to say, shut things off. Anything above that, and the electrons are like, I can't do anything about this electric field. It's changing too rapidly, and the radio waves go out. So that means basically the Earth is surrounded by this conductor. And all radio frequencies below 10 megahertz just basically bounce back. Um, so uh, that sort of tells you that if you want to observe the, the sun, and who doesn't want to observe the sun, right? Uh, in radio, you have to do it above 10 megahertz. Right? Below that, you're inside a conductor. You ain't seeing nothing. Right? Above 10 megahertz, and, and it would be nice to be well above 10 megahertz so the ionosphere doesn't even deflect your radio signals, Yet your radio waves go straight out. Um, OK. Uh, <coughs> that being said, let's see. Well, we've got a few more minutes, so we can keep going on this, because we're going to get to the magnetosphere eventually, I promise. Uh, one of the things that we brought up is the sun has a corona because it has a magnetic field, and its magnetic field oscillates. And you saw this yesterday in the dynamo lab. 
Uh, it, it has periods with strong magnetic field and weak magnetic field, which means lots of x-rays and little x-rays. That actually gives us the other two curves. Remember I just pointed at the night and day curves. We actually have the solar max curves and the solar min curves. So even though night and day are very close here, solar max is very different from solar min. That's because the electrons do have time to find partners over a period of five years. Okay, so during solar minimum, they have reached a new equilibrium where their production rate, Q, has gone down because the x-rays that are ionizing them have gone down. So there, there's quite a bit of uh, interplay between the, the, the sun's magnetic field and sun's corona and what this ionosphere is going to look like. Uh, here is, and Jan Soika, I think this is out of his chapter, will be here. This is sort of a, a diagram of, of showing what happens as this x-ray flux increases. And he has a sort of uh, a logarithmic variable s, which he increases from minus 1 up to 3. And you see the density of electrons going up, sort of when you're at this very low state, your peak electron density is only going to be at about 10 to the 4, 10 to the 4 or so. And it gets higher and higher. And he also shows you how the different ion species have slightly different structures as you go up. OK? Um, so this is all what our ionosphere looks like on Earth, because we have an atmosphere with these kind of constituents, nitrogen and oxygen mostly. You can see here, you just have those molecules. And when they start getting ionized, they're going to recombine into other interesting things like NO. Uh, now we can go into the comparative heliosphere part and say, what if we were on a different planet? And uh, we are just, as you saw yesterday, starting to get a handle on what the atmospheres of exoplanets look like. So let's stick closer to home and think about some, some nice solar system planets like Mars and Venus. Uh, the Earth, nitrogen, is most of our atmosphere, 77%. Uh, oxygen is 21, a bunch of other things. There are sort of the logarithmic of the, of the cross-section that you're going to get, uh, that um, 10 to the minus 25 or so. Um, Venus, very heavily dominated CO2 atmosphere. Mars actually uh, as well. So we're kind of the oddballs. They have atmospheres that are mostly CO2. So that's going to lead to a, a different kind of, of uh, ionosphere because we have different things to get ionized. So here's a picture of, I guess, uh, this is the picture of the ionosphere in Venus. This is the kind of chemistry diagram, which I didn't understand before. Uh, we have CO2. It gets ionized to form CO2 plus. And then it creates, oh, I know what this is. This is an oxygen molecule, an oxygen joining it, or, and, or yeah, joining it. And then you get your O plus. Uh, yeah, and et cetera. You get, you get basically this kind of interaction. And so you end up with an ionosphere that has, again, your, your ionized single oxygens. You also have ionized carbons. There is some nitrogen there. It's not a, a major part, but it's a 3% part. You can see it's here all, many orders of magnitude below these peaks. So a different set of ion structures, but the elect oh, and this is Mars. Um, curiously, the number densities we were seeing for electrons, and obviously whatever the peak is here, is giving up most of the electrons. So the electron density is going to follow the outside of these. Going to be 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6. It's kind of curious. Mars a little further away. It's like an order of magnitude lower than the Earth's. But it has an ionosphere not too different. So. I'm going to ask you a question then. Let's say we heard yesterday about uh, different stars and the way exoplanets work. Uh, let's say it's a Jupiter-sized planet, and it's very close to its star, but it's orbiting a very hot star, 10 times the mass of the sun. So the surface temperature is 20,000 Kelvin. Uh, it is 10,000 times more bright 
This is all sort of basic astrophysics stuff. Does this planet, do we expect it to have an ionosphere of the kind that we're looking at here? Very bright star, and I'm actually really close to it. This is a hot Jupiter. Marika's saying no. Why not? Oh, okay. Let's say it held on to its atmosphere. Wait, why would it have outflows? Uh, why would it have outflows? Let me, sorry. Is, that, is that really what? Oh, yeah. okay. I'm not talking about after the supernova. This thing will supernova. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We've caught it before it supernova. There'd be, I think, serious, serious, uh, shoot, Spica. Spica is a B-type star. Maybe a O. Um, right, that's the, that's the, hot end of that Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Of all the interesting things we know about stars like that, what is the one thing that we've brought up over and over again, other than that they're hot and big? What? Well, yeah, they don't have dynamos. They don't have conjection zones. This is one of those completely radiative stars. Maybe it has a dynamo in the core. It doesn't have. No dynamo means no magnetic field, no corona. So we'll have some UV. That's going to create a nice ozone layer. But ionosphere, remember, that's the really short wavelengths. Those come from the corona. So this thing isn't going to have a corona. It's not going to have those x-rays. So hot and bright as it is, it's going to sunburn you wicked fast. It's not going to ionize your atmosphere. And also, Marika, it won't have, will it have a solar wind, a stellar wind? No, without a corona, nothing's there to blow off. So, so actually, it won't strip the atmosphere that way either. It'll maybe photo-ionize things slowly over billions of years. You might lose your atmosphere. Yeah. How about the, what we're starting to hear about, like uh, TRAPPIST-1, all these M stars, which are really cool. Like Some of them are 2,000, 3,000 degrees surface temperature. But the same line of reasoning led us to believe those stars, dynamo, yes, no. Yeah, that, I think they're convective, all convective. Yeah, in the lab, <laughs> it looked like that. Somehow that doesn't seem to work. There's a, there's a controversy about how important the tachocline really is. The lab was all about the tachocline. Um, those stars, fully convective stars, generate lots and lots of magnetic fields. So yeah, we get good, good coronae, and you're going to have a heck of an uh, ionosphere around a star like this, an M star. So what we'll hear about, I think, Monday, right? Um, we're going to hear about uh, some of the space weather effects from uh, Tuesday, even. Um, sorry, I, I planned this schedule back in whenever March, and I, I lost it. Anyway, we'll hear we'll hear more about those. Uh, so, uh, on the other hand, the uh, things like without the planets that don't have magnetic fields, like uh, Jupiter, or sorry, Jupiter, like Venus or Mars. Let me read my slide here. Uh, essentially, they're just a ball. They don't have this really cool magnetic field. Uh, it's non-magnetic, but it does have this ionosphere, which, as I said, makes it seem to the solar wind like a metal ball. Right? The solar wind doesn't know that Mars has all this cool iron oxide all over the surface. It just sees this conducting layer and basically, it's a plasma with magnetic fields, et cetera. And as far as it sees, it's a magnetic ball. So the magnetic field isn't going to penetrate into any of these bodies. It's got to deflect around them. That means the solar wind that's carrying that magnetic field has to deflect around them. And you get this nice sort of shock where you have winds coming in from the solar wind. And then it shocks in what's known as a bow shock and then goes around this metal ball. 
Okay, so the, the structure of the solar wind interaction with a um, with a non-magnetized body is pretty interesting. Uh, and one of the things, if you haven't had a lot of fluid mechanics, essentially the, the solar wind, and we'll get to this here, we have a nice picture, uh, is moving at typical speed for the solar wind here? What? It's super alphanic. OK, let's put that. Do you know how many kilometers per second it's going? 400, maybe if you're in the fast wind, 800. Yeah, which is above the alphane speed. Actually, does anyone happen to know if, if it were a million Kelvin, what the sound speed would be? You know any typical numbers? I, I carry it around for a million. You can divide by square root of 10 and get 10,000. That's 100 kilometers per second. So the wind is going 800 kilometers per second. The sound is going 100. It is Mach 8. Okay. Supersonic things, why are they so cool? Well, there's so many reasons they're so cool. One of the things is there's no way information from up ahead of you can make it to you. Because that information is traveling at the sound speed, 100 kilometers per second, into an 800 kilometer per second wind. It's actually losing ground <laughs> at the rate of 700 kilometers per second. So you don't know anything about what's ahead of you. That is what it's like to be supersonic. So this wind, that's the reason, well, the, the reason these are drawn straight is just because it's so nice, easy to draw straight lines. But really, they are straight. They, they know nothing about what's coming up ahead of them. And, and what a shock is, my favorite definition of a shock, is a hydrodynamic surprise. This is where the fluid learns that there's something ahead of it. And it does that by having a jump in its own velocity. It drops its velocity way down, and its temperature goes way up, which means the sound speed goes way up. Everything downstream of the bow shock is subsonic. So it's a transition from supersonic to subsonic flow. And you can see these streamlines know. They know they're not going to hit Jupiter or <laughs> Venus. Why do I keep calling it Jupiter? But they also know that other things ahead of them are, are getting in their way, and they need to steer around them. That's the reason when you're driving late at night in the snow, all the snowflakes are going over, you know, they're basically going over the hood of your car. They're not hitting your windshield. They know you're coming. Well, they know you're coming provided you're driving subsonically. And don't drive supersonically. It's illegal. It's dangerous. It's actually impossible. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so, so we have this experience with su subsonic flows that they, they kind of steer around things. And that's what happens down here. Upstream, you, you don't have that luxury. So that's why you get this nice bow shock. Um, and here's, here's a nice little, I'll, I'll let you uh, go through this at length uh, in, in your spare time. But this is just a nice calculation you can do to say, how much space do you need to shove all of that fluid around your metal ball? Uh, and it basically tends to be something on the order of 20% of the radius of this thing, 0.18 times the radius of this thing, because the density jumps. Not only does the temperature jump, but the density after the, after the shock jumps. Uh, but it's kind of limited how much it can jump. Anyone, anyone who has worked on this? The maximum jump you can get if you're an ionized plasma, four. The number's four. You can get a jump of four. So basically, the, the material down here is four times the density. And so you, you can shove it through this narrow range as it comes in, through this narrow little opening. Um, and downstream, way, way downstream, uh, actually, the surprise is not a great surprise. These fluid elements find out, oh, you know, you've already passed this planet and all this fluid is coming past you. Uh, the surprise is so mild that it's actually a linear perturbation. It's a sound wave. Okay, so a strong shock is like a nonlinear sound wave, but out here it's more like a linear sound wave. So it moves at the speed of sound, and you can work out that the angle you're going to make is one, the arc sine of 1 over the Mach number. Or if the Mach number is very big, like 8, it's basically in radians 1 one eighth. Okay, 
And that's known as the mock cone. Um, just to, to sort of uh, show you the typical way that this works, here is those flow lines. Um, here is the temperature. The temperature drops, jumps by a huge amount. Basically, the, the bulk kinetic energy, if you have something going at Mach 8, then the kinetic energy of the flow itself, not the random motions, is 16 times more energetic than the random motions are. Right? So basically, it's, it's like bullets. <laughs> the, the, the random motions just doesn't matter. It's, it's just the, uh, but once you hit the shock, all of that energy, not all of it, three-eighths of it, is converted to kinetic random motions. That's why you get so much hotter. Uh, so when the sun is only coming at, well, so basically when it's coming at 400 kilometers per second, when you shock it, even though it's less than a million, and actually I haven't even told you what it is, it doesn't matter, it's so small, uh, you go up to 3.6 megakelvin after this shock. That's your bulk kinetic energy. That's how much energy, that's what the temperature is going to be downstream of the shock. And then you'll heat up a little bit if you actually happen to be on this streamline that goes all the way to the center and you have to come to rest. Bernoulli's principle tells you that you're going to gain a little bit more energy. But you have million Kelvin temperatures inside of the shock, all because you have a, a, a flow speed of 400 kilometers per second. And here's a more a more complicated calculation of this temperature and the way that that varies. Uh, it also means the Mach number here is lower than one. It's subsonic. Actually, out here, the Mach number is l greater than one. But what really matters when you're a fluid element crossing here is what is the Mach number as you approach the, the shock from outside, the normal. And that's always going to be above one. Um, so. Here's a sort of picture of this kind of uh, bow shock around Mars. A nice cartoon comes again from the textbooks. Uh, and that, that sort of shows us what this thing is going to look like. Um, Venus, and here they've actually shown you what really matters. The fluid itself would have no trouble just going straight through the atmosphere. But the problem is the fluid is a conductor, the, the uh, solar wind. And it's got magnetic field lines going along with it. And the magnetic field lines see a metal surface. Remember, metal is my generic thought of a good conductor. The ionosphere is a good conductor. And they say, no, we're not going in there. You've got to take us around <laughs> the outside. OK. So I think this, this is a, everything we wanted to do with the ionosphere and actually now the interaction with the solar wind. So let's take a, a few minutes, and maybe I can refresh my coffee. Before, any, any questions on what we've done so far? Why there's an ionosphere and why it matters when the ionosphere is the only thing you have? That's, that's what's protecting you from the solar wind. It creates these nice bow shocks. OK, let's get some fresh in our coffee. I'll be back here in, uh, at 25 past, five minutes. <laughs> on your beautiful treatment of night side ionosphere. Oh, okay. It's, uh, I don't want to throw you off your pace and anything else, or we can wait to the end of the questions. It's just, no. I think you, um, it also shamelessly presages comparative magnetosphere. That, that is a, uh, an excellent reason to do exactly that. Can just, you, a, ju ju just an offer. Should, should, we, um, should we challenge them right after the, bef before we get into magnetospheres? Yeah, just because you. So your module sort of ended at this point. And, uh, well, I'm going to do a lot of the same things with the magnetic field, creating the bow shock around the mag magnetosphere. Is your question going to involve that? No, but ba basically, basically, as you as you show so, as you show so beautifully, <laughs> as you get higher in all three all the three planet atmospheres, they start to look more and more like. That's because of the photochemistry. Yeah. There's already got a lot of oxygen. You get the oxygen from CO2 at Mars and uh, from at Mars O2 and at Venus. Here. However, uh, if you actually compute uh, on the night side when you're under shadow, if you actually compute these uh, uh, these um, uh, uh, recombination rates uh, the, uh, 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 at the Earth, you would lose the night side ionosphere in uh, just a few hours. Okay. Uh, 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 Mars.
is located the same way. The top side, at least, is going to be absolutely the, the same. Venus, um, same situation. <laughs> but, here, but the interesting question with uh, the interesting question. Uh, so the reason we have a night side and night sphere here is the plasma sphere. We have a big reservoir. The reservoir is set up right. by the magnetic field. But you go to Mars, you got the same location. Right? So if you were going to lose it at the Earth, you'd expect to, you know, you'd say, I'm, I'm not going to lose it at Mars. Right. And Mars doesn't have a magnetic field with no plasma sphere. So actually, Mars does recombine. So I was, I was going to ask a question, but I, I thought this was going to go on, essentially, right? I mean, uh, what yeah. happens in interaction? How do you lose? Right, right. The material. Yeah. Usually, um, and I think this year as well, uh, Jan Soika will come and give us. You're talking about losing to the solar wind, or the, re or the ionosphere goes or away just, just going with away because of recombination. Yes, yeah, so that's one. Yeah. You know, when you are on the dark. There's a little bit. There's a little bit of direct stripping that you observe it at at, at Venus. Mars, for example, I don't know what well, happens. Well, Mars, Mars, Mars is mostly. I don't know actually, but I also know I need coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, I'll try to answer it. Uh, is this about the um, winning ship at the... No, no, I was going to talk with Nika. Andres. See you. How are you? Very good. Lacking coffee, though. You're taking the mic with you, no? So I know. <laughs> don't worry. I've got it I've got it covered here. It's a hot mic. So the solar wind for the ionosphere is conducted. Yes. But um, the solar wind. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, right. when you say that, that you, um, but then, then uh, why is it not um, very good? applicable to um, um, an ionosphere. But it is. But with the collisions? Well, the, you know, with collisions, you really have to say what is the rate of collisions. And I just went through the um, plasma frequency. But you yeah. also have uh, ion electron collision frequency, which is going to tell you, oh, shoot. Um, which, is going to, which is going to tell you uh, Another another component of that, okay. I think the collision frequency is very low, high up in the uh, in the ionosphere anyway. But you do have these ion neutral collisions, yeah. uh, low down. But what are those collision frequencies? No, but I mean, not longer than a minute. Oh, oh, you mean the time scale? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so when you say something to conduct that, you're really saying on what time it is. Oh. You know, when you're talking about sort of the interaction of the solar wind and the planet, you're talking about the longish time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the magnetic field from the solar wind, it could penetrate into the ionosphere due to the resistivity, but it would take minutes or maybe even longer. But if you have a magnetosphere, it doesn't change it, I guess. And then there's the magnetosphere. Yeah. That's a different story. Too. Okay. I've only painted the picture of when you just had nothing but an ionosphere yeah, yeah, yeah. on the surface, yeah. and the next, the next forty minutes are going to be about the ionosphere. Jim, actually, if, how about you, you can pose this while we call everyone back into the room. Uh, the, the people who are, while we wait. I, I, could, I could do it now for the, the, the few, the brave, uh, the proud who are still here. They're looking bored. So. Look, you can't look bored. It never partic uh, so uh, I, I thought maybe today we could uh, practice uh, the kind of uh, uh, a sample of the discussion that might take place uh, during a PhD qual exam. Uh, I, I have reason to believe that a good fraction of you are thinking about uh, graduate school. So I, I really loved uh, it was uh, this issue of um, or this discussion of uh, planetary ionospheres, particularly on the night side. This was a really burning subject. Uh, as recently as the 1970s. 
Uh, uh, previously, it had gone through a peak of interest back when something called radio was invented on planet Earth. And uh, just, as, uh, just, as you were, just as you were hearing a few minutes ago, uh, when radio was first discovered, uh, what did people notice? And we've all noticed this uh, when our parents are forcing us to go in cars for 10 hours late at night. All of a sudden, you start hearing uh, uh, radio stations that are speaking German or, or Russian or something. And the reason is, of course, the ionosphere uh, indeed on the, on the night side has, uh, uh, has become a little bit more dilute. And more importantly, uh, the primary conducting layer where that critical um, uh, plasma frequency uh, peaks has lifted to higher altitudes. So one skip all of a sudden gets you a station on the, on the other side of the planet. But let's come back to the, to the 1970s. So, uh, uh, so uh, we sent probes. Uh, uh, we sent probes to Mars. We sent probes uh, to Venus. Uh, they found the atmospheres that were shown in the earlier in the earlier chart. Now these planets are very interesting. Venus and and, uh, and the Earth uh, look like they ought to be sisters or, or brothers, just from the standpoint of the size. They both have fairly dense atmospheres. There are some differences in composition, but once you get up high, all the terrestrial plants when you get up high. Photochemistry basically dictates that you wind up with uh, oxygen, uh, molecular and atomic oxygen, plus the hydrogen, of course, and it becomes, uh, and it becomes ionized. So Mars, uh, but Venus, though, is almost not rotating. It's, I think, uh, gosh, trying to remember my own qual exam, maybe 243 days, something like that, for a rotation period. It's not quite tidally locked with the sun. Mars, on the other hand, has a, has a, uh, it's only like, what, 30 minutes uh, shorter rotation period uh, than, than the Earth. So you start thinking about the photochemistry that was being discussed a little bit, uh, a little bit earlier. So first of all, um, uh, the, Earth has, um, uh, the Earth manages to maintain its uh, ionospheres it, as it goes through the, the night side. And, uh, but, it, but, it, uh, but at Venus, with a 243 days, so that'd be like 120 days for recombination, would you know? Would you uh, would you expect any type of nightside ionosphere at Venus? And uh, if you uh, if you told us in the in the exam, uh, you know, no, because the recombination rates uh, I think I remember from class are such and such, and it should all go away in an hour or two. Well, the fact of the matter is, before the first uh, ionospheric uh, probes, uh, the first one was Pioneer Venus in 78, when I was a graduate student arrived, actually the scientists, the professors, all agreed with you. And they were busy calculating what the minute uh, uh, density of the ionosphere on the night side of Venus might be as a result of just the random cosmic ray uh, coming in, causing a little ionization. When we got there with Pioneer Venus, we found there was very little uh, change in the density between day side and night side at Venus. What the heck? And this would be the point where the professors could take you through all the kinds of things you're seeing up here. It turns out that in the case of Venus, lacking a global magnetic field and being so close to the sun, uh, that very dense ionosphere that's created on the day side, it gets heated and it hydrodynamically flows to the night side. As a matter of fact, it's uh, at high altitudes, uh, the temperatures are so high, uh, as it goes around the terminator, it's almost at the sonic speed. There's no, uh, if you go back to the solar wind talks, there's no, uh, there's no critical point. There's no choke point that will allow it to go supersonic. Actually, if it went supersonic, it would actually start to just leave the planet. It would have enough energy to leave the planet. So, okay, so that was the, um, uh, the Venus part of it. But now let's think about Mars. Mars has got the same rotation rate um, as the Earth. And, uh, and gosh, we just had this example of Venus. And so they would say, you know, what do you expect? You know, the Earth has a night side ionosphere. Mars is only rotating, it's rotating 30 minutes uh, slower. Yeah, slower, yeah, 23 hours and 30 minutes or something. And so if the Earth manages to have a night side ionosphere, shouldn't Mars also have a night side ionosphere? See, this is what makes it a perfect, uh, a perfect qual exam. Today we say discussion. Uh, we used to use other words for it. Uh, well, the fact of the matter is, until the latest generation of plasma instruments were sent to Mars, the fact is Mars has almost no night side ionosphere. I mean, I'm talking about densities of uh, 
you know, 10 particles per cc, 50 particles per cc. Whatever you do, don't try to count on, you know, radio, skipping a radio wave off the night side of Mars, you know, in an effort to save your friends who are running out of oxygen or something, uh, because there's just not enough ionosphere there. So why in the heck does Mars have no ionosphere in the Earth, uh, and, and the Earth has, uh, uh, has this very dense night side uh, uh, ionosphere? Does anybody know? It's because of the fact that the Earth is magnetized, and the closed dipole, the inner part of the magnetosphere with those closed field lines, uh, you get this huge reservoir of, um, uh, of plasma that has, that has gotten a little, bit, a little bit of heating on the top side, and it's expanded out to create what we call the plasma pause, another pause. Uh, to follow that theme. And that reservoir uh, actually replenishes uh, and maintains the Earth's uh, ionosphere at night. But Mars, I think as you heard the other day, doesn't have a global uh, magnetic field. So there's, uh, you know, there's no reservoir available. Or there's, no mag there's no magnetic uh, uh, volume in which uh, to uh, save up the odd uh, uh, I particle from the ionosphere and store it for when they need it on the night side. So anyway, that was also a shameless plug for the power of comparative studies of the different planetary environments and how it enriches our understanding, uh, not only of these other you know, places that we may or may not ever you know, walk, uh, but also, of course, our, our own planet. It really, it really sharpens your understanding of these kinds of phenomena. And thank you very much. Okay, thank you, yeah. Can you tell us more about what comparative magnetospheres? And then Jan Soika will tell us about some comparative ionospheres and that kind of thing. Okay, thank you, yeah. So I went a detail through the, uh, the way in which the solar wind hits these conducting bodies, and the conducting bodies were the unmagnetized planets with their ionospheres. But we have these planets that, as we saw in the very first lecture, and we saw yesterday morning, uh, Earth, Jupiter, and Saturn all have a dynamo inside, and they generate a magnetic field. And that magnetic field comes outside of the planet and creates this magnetosphere, creates this bubble of magnetic field uh, around the planet. And of course, the solar wind is conducting. So it's not going to be able to penetrate into the magnetic fields of these bodies, yet alone down to the ionosphere. So the interaction, in some ways, is very different. It's an interaction not with a solid metal ball, but with this squishy uh, obstacle, basically the magnetic field. Um, and so part of understanding the magnetosphere is understanding how the solar wind is going to squish up against it and form it. Uh, and if we go through this same exercise, we'll actually figure out that what you're going to need in order to create this bow shock is you need a, you need a magnetic pressure, okay, which is b squared over 8 pi, sorry, I work in CGS units, um, that basically is capable of stopping the solar wind. And we all know it stops it there, and then there's this region that is the, the magneto sheath or the bow sheath uh, that we just talked about. Essentially, what you need is for that magnetic field pressure, that energy, that pressure, to balance the incoming ram pressure. Okay, And so the ram pressure, or the pressure at the stagnation point, is the rho v squared, rho u squared. And then this comes about from basically trying to figure out how much, how much that energy gets converted from bulk kinetic energy to, uh, plasma, to plasma pressure. But there's the stagnation pressure. You need a magnetic field that balances that. Um, we talked at length, and I, this is one of the reasons I, I like to do all of these lectures, so I can sort of cover one thing and then have it come back up, that the Earth's magnetic field is not a perfect dipole. But by the time you get to the surface, it's very much dominated by the dipole. And by the time you get to far away from the Earth, it's definitely dominated by a, a dipole. So I write the magnetic field, as I always have, as minus grad chi. Uh, and then I put in the chi that I know for a dipole that's going to stop. This is similar to the, to the kinds of fields we were using before. And then I balance those. And I find that this 
magnetic field strength is going to go as whatever the dipole moment or the, di the magnetic field strength at the Earth is times the sixth power, inverse sixth power of this distance. So the further away I get, the weaker that magnetic field is. Of course, a dipole magnetic field falls off as radius cubed, one over radius cubed, and the pressure falls off as one over radius to the sixth power. So this is the, this is the magnetic energy pressure that's going to balance the ram pressure. And so you can already see how squishy it is. If I want, if I want to uh, balance it, I basically have to find the, oh, sorry, I want to find the distance that balances this, and that is going to go as the inverse, the one sixth power of that ram pressure. Okay, this is known as the Chapman Ferraro distance. This tells us how far away the magnetic field is going to be able to hold off the solar wind, and therefore basically the size of our magnetic bubble. Does that make sense to everyone? A lot of you have probably seen this calculation done. So if you put in the numbers here, you find that's about 12 times the, solar, the Earth's radius. This is this very simple calculation. So basically, we have a bubble that has 12 times the radius of the Earth. And let's just put in, a, a, let's just see if we, if we can remember uh, some of the other places around the Earth of note. For instance, our weather satellites, our satellite dish satellites, geostationary satellites, SDO. A lot of us work with SDO, so geostationary. People know where those orbit? 6.6, .6, right? So, oops, there it is, 6.5. So less than 12. So they're inside the magnetosphere. Right? That, is, that is comfortably inside the magnetosphere. Uh, how about the moon? <laughs> 60. Yeah. And here I sort of show, even if you didn't know this, again, going back to preparing for your quals, you know that a geostationary orbit has to go around once in 24 hours, and then you use uh, Kepler, Kepler's law to figure out that. And the moon takes 28 days to go around, and so it's 60, 20, 58. So that's outside the magnetosphere, or outside at least the magnetopause. Um, what will happen if this, this was all done for a solar wind speed of 400 kilometers per second. We know that that's the slow solar wind, 12 Earth radii. What then happens if I boost this up to 800 kilometers per second? Fast solar wind. First of all, which does the magnetosphere care about that? And all we're talking about right now is so far is the magnetopause, where, where that standoff is. Is that going to change? Yeah, it pushes it in. OK. Uh, for this simple exercise, I didn't want to think about the, the uh, density. The density does change. But here, I'm just thinking about changing that. So it pushes it in. By the velocity is twice as high, does the magnetosphere go into six Earth radii, Twi twice as close in? Yeah, no? Increase P solar wind. It appears in the denominator here. So you increase this, and the distance goes down. What? Right, or 2 to the power 1 third, or a lot less than 2. right? So it goes, it goes in by like 20%. Yeah. So. Uh, your, your geostationary satellites are still safely inside of it. OK, okay that's just uh, some of that. Uh, so this is just sort of showing you that we've had uh, some complicated codes that more or less show you the crude level I've been describing this, that this is the sort of, sort of picture you're going to get. Um, let's, let's take this same exercise and start doing comparative Magnetospheres. Uh, I hope this doesn't steal everything that Jim was going to tell us. I doubt it does. Uh, Jupiter, as we saw, is a has a very good dynamo. It is a, a very nicely uh, turbulent interior that has a liquid 
uh, liquid hydrogen metal interior. It generates a magnetic field that is something on the order of 15 times as strong as the Earth. However, an even more important factor is the density of the solar wind. And you all saw this in your lab. Falls off as 1 over distance squared. And Jupiter is much further away. OK, so the density has fallen off to 4% of the solar wind density. What roughly happens to the, did I say that up here? To the velocity as you go out in the solar wind? What? <laughs> Sorry, you have to speak up. What? Density falls off. About constant, yeah. So, so the, the, that ram pressure, though, is going to fall off as um, the ram pressure is going to fall off as you know distance. And so, oops. So, the magnetopause of Jupiter. Uh, did I put it up here? I thought I put it up here. Oh yeah, there it is. Fifty times the radius of Jupiter. It's huge. Okay, the magnetosphere of Jupiter is a really, really big thing. That's uh, basically half the radius of the sun. That's the magnetopause. That's the, the near-end nose point. And if you account for this piece out here, right? this is the radius of the sun. And so the magnetosphere of Jupiter is bigger than the sun. <laughs> it is big. Uh, and it's mostly because the magnetic field is so strong in the. Um, all right, but this is, we've been talking about this little place here. Uh, and the magnetic field is being brought in by the solar wind. And the solar wind slows down at the bow shock. But the next thing it has to do is it still has to go up to bump up against this, uh, this place where the stagnation point is. And the magnetic field of the solar wind will then be brought pretty close to the magnetic field of the Earth. And the story is going to be very different depending on which way that magnetic field from the solar wind is oriented. Uh, this shows magnetic field from the solar wind, what we call a southward IMF. Magnetic field from the solar wind that points downward, and the Earth's magnetic field points upward. So that gives us an opportunity for doing some of this stuff we were talking about before, magnetic reconnection. Right? We have places where the magnetic fields from the Earth and the Sun are going to reconnect and basically get brought over the poles or under the poles. If you look at it from above, the magnetic, the, the wind goes around. But this is, this is how this magnetic field, and this is known as the Dungy cycle. We basically have magnetic field being opened up, Earth's magnetic field being opened up to the solar wind at the, at the uh, magnetopause there, and then closed back down in the magneto tail. Okay. And there's a certain rate, phi dot, at which you're opening and closing magnetic fields. Now, you expect those two to balance each other. Uh, one other thing we should point out is on the downstream side, this, if this magnetic field kept being dragged open, it's going to point, say, towards the North Pole, and then below that, away from the South Pole. And we'll have something very similar to what we had on the, the solar uh, the the uh, solar the heliosphere, that is, a region where the inward and outward magnetic fields come into contact. And that was called the heliospheric current sheet. And this is actually the uh, neutral sheet in the Earth. And it's, it's a basically dragged out there as the magnetic field is dragged out. And the downstream magneto tail reconnection has to happen across this current sheet. OK? Um, so, this region here where this is happening, this is called the magneto tail. And, that's, and when, one of the things you can do is sort of try to figure out how much flux is in this magneto tail. And essentially, the, the reason you need the magneto tail is you need a long enough sheet to close down all the magnetic field that's being opened up there. You need to reach this balance where what's being closed is matching what's being opened. Uh, and so here are this uh, neutral sheet being dragged out. Uh, and this is actually, this is Enceladus. This is, uh, this is Saturn, I guess. Oh, sorry, this is Saturn. This is Enceladus. 
So this is showing you what this kind of picture looks like in another magnetized body. You have this, this same region of closed magnetic fields being opened, being dragged out in the magneto tail, and being closed back down. Uh, so here's a, here's a picture of what it looks like on Neptune. Uh, and one of the more dramatic consequences of this is you have this, this region where some of these magnetic fields are going out to the magneto tail, and they're all leaving the Earth from somewhere up close to the, the polar cap. And this is a nice image taken from space. Uh, I didn't know that you could see the, the coastlines in space, but apparently you can. There's our nice coastlines. And you see this is what's known as the auroral oval. This is the boundary. Everything inside of this circle are magnetic field lines that are going out and going into the magneto tail. Everything on the outside is closing down. Right? So that's the boundary between the open and closed regions. Now, I want to go through another couple of uh, uh, sort of back of the envelope calculations. The size of this magneto tail, you can work out the same way we were working other things out. Essentially, we have a balance. We have to, we have to maintain this magnetized cylinder, if you want, uh, with its magnetic pressure against the solar wind that actually is flowing around it. Okay, it's gone through the bow shock and it's just flowing through here. Uh, and in this case, we have the same kind of magnetic balance, except it's not a dipole that we're balancing. It's basically a tube of flux. Okay, so the total amount of flux, phi, is just the magnetic field strength inside here. And to calculate that magnetic field strength, what we need to do is calculate all the magnetic field that came out of here. Right? That's all the magnetic field that's going into the top half of that cylinder has come out from Greenland and the, the polar seas. So that is the total amount of magnetic flux. That's the total area of that. And then there's the magnetic field strength. So there's area of that polar cap. And that gives us 10 to the 17 Maxwells. That's actually very similar magnetic flux to what is actually observed in an EUV image, a coronal loop. So uh, there, are, there are a lot of reasons to think that we can carry some information about uh, magnetic reconnection, say, in the uh, magnetosphere to the, uh, solar, the solar corona. That's one little, I think that's more of a uh, coincidence than anything else. OK, so we balance this pressure with the ram pressure of the solar or the pressure of the solar wind. And we basically see that this thing here has to be about 25 Earth radii. So this cusp here was 12. And then it has to expand out to 25 and give us about a 10 nanotesla field out there in order to balance the solar wind pressure. So we have the, the sort of general structure of the magnetosphere just from these back of the envelope calculations. Uh, here's a nice picture, a famous picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of the auroral oval on Jupiter. Uh, and it has these nice little dots uh, with little trailing gizmos around it. Has anyone, anyone, has people seen this picture before? Yeah. You know what those little dots are? The moons. This is a magnetic field line that's going through. I not, <laughs> we, we've often had Fran Bagenal here uh, doing this lecture. And she'll tell you each moon. Uh, I can't tell you, but the, there's a couple of moons visible here. Because those moons, unlike our moon, are inside the magnetosphere. And so they're closed field lines that are, or open field lines that are touching those moons. Uh, OK. So one of the things that uh, we can work out then is we have this magneto tail with all the magnetic field being closed back down. And we have the reconnection going on at the poles. And we basically have to move the magnetic field lines from the day side, from the magnetopause, over to the night side and then reconnect them. So there has to be this motion. And this motion is known as convection. It's actually more like advection, right? It's motion. However, we have heard, and I think you've heard on several occasions, that there is this frozen in field condition, that magnetic field lines get moved 
with the fluid. And therefore, if I were to try to drag a magnetic field from here over to here to over to here, I would have to take the magnetic field line that's being generated in the dynamo and move the dynamo around to the night side. Move that portion. Is that right? Okay. I know I, the structure isn't changing, but I, it seems like I need to move the magnetic fields. I was told that the magnetic fields and the plasma have to move together. And definitely, there's a nice conductor in here. That's what's generating the magnetic field. And it's not moving very fast. Remember, it's like a, a mil, uh, less than a millimeter per second. So it's definitely not going to make it from the night side to the day side in any short period of time. Yeah, that frozen in field condition applies to the conductor, uh, a nice electrical conductor. And this plasma around here is a very good conductor. The Earth's core is a very good conductor. Between the two is us. Right? We're, we're reasonably good conductors, but the, the the Earth's mantle is not. So there's basically a layer where this idea of frozen in field does not apply. Okay, and that's that's really the key thing. It's the atmosphere and the solid crust, they're insulators. So there is the one place that maybe these people who've told you, well, magnetic fields are imaginary. They're not real things. That's not true. Magnetic fields are very real here. They're made of stuff. That's what it means to be real, to be made of stuff. And in the core of the Earth, they're made of stuff. In the atmosphere, in the room, they're not made of stuff. They're basically uh, imaginary there. OK. So here's, the, here's a sort of uh, simple picture of what happens when you have magnetic field lines that are frozen in. And here I've drawn the magnetic field lines coming in, and I have two, two views of this. This is basically the edge on view. The solar wind is moving this way up here, and it's dragging the magnetic fields with it. I'm going to have, I'm going to try to play this game as if the magnetic field or the, the solar wind suddenly just started, decided to start moving. So it's going to start moving uh, at some instant, and the magnetic field lines are going to be <laughs> dragged with it as, it as it's moved. So you can see they're already starting to bend over like this. Uh, we have an electric field, which is minus V cross B. V is this way. B is up. So you can work out uh, minus V cross B is out of the page. And there's a current that comes from their bending. Right? You can do the right hand rule. So there's this layer of current here. Now, not only is the, is the solar wind in this picture turned on at an instant, it actually only exists across a finite range. So I'm going to flip my, my viewpoint around and look at it from, I guess, over here. Nope, sorry. I'm going to look at it from over here. So the flow is away from me, but it's only away from me in a slab. There's only a region of magnetic field. And this is basically that region that's being dragged over the polar cap. But I want to do it in a simpler geometry. So I have this current that's coming out of the page here. And that current is actually going up there and then going back up. So it basically forms a closed circuit because these magnetic field lines are not bent. These don't connect to anything that's moving. These don't connect to anything that's moving. So there's a boundary between the sheared magnetic field and the unsheared magnetic field. Is this geometry kind of clear? So now. One of the things you'll notice, here's the ionosphere. This is a good conductor. Here's the atmosphere. It's not. I've drawn the magnetic field vectors, the vectors B everywhere, because B exists everywhere. But I've only drawn the field lines down to here. Because as we discussed, there's no frozen in field here, so there's no field lines here. OK. And so what happens is the fluid, the flow, continues to drag this, uh, this magnetic field. And so this bend moves down. And then it moves down and basically gets into the ionosphere and then stays there. And at that point, 
we have magnetic field lines that are just moving, sorry, I'll have to do this in reverse, that are just bent because they were sheared by the solar wind and moving to the right. The magnetic field down here doesn't change and there's basically no, there's no uh, idea of field lines. So in a way you can think of the field lines as just being touching this ionosphere and moving along the surface. The current that used to be responsible for bending the magnetic field is now carried entirely in the ionosphere. And if you think about this as only being a slab, there is a current that comes down from far away from the magnetosphere, enters the ionosphere, and then goes back up. Sort of closes in this, in this pattern. Is this clear? This is sort of trying to reconcile these ideas we have of frozen in flux and and then a region that doesn't have frozen in flux. So the motion of the, of the magnetic field lines, which is true because magnetic field lines are real out here, they're moving, uh, they're basically sliding across the top. And that creates this ionospheric current and it actually is a current that has to close. Okay, So there's current, there's current pathways that have to come in and come back out. Okay, And these currents are actually you'll notice they go along the magnetic field. Certainly in this viewpoint, it looks like they're exactly pointed along the. So these in the, in the terminology of ion, magnetospheric, ionospheric community are field aligned currents, and this is not. This is the, the path that closes through the ionosphere. Okay, and then that's the picture we get from uh, Jeff Hughes, I believe. Um, in, his, in his chapter here. Uh, and essentially you have the magnetic field line, and I think they've numbered them very conveniently here. Here's the day side, here's the magnetic field line that's reconnected, brought across, brought into the magnetotail, reconnected, and then brought back over here. And there's one, two, three, four, five. And actually what you see here is in this same picture, that magnetic field line has to be brought all the way back around and then reconnected again, and it's a cycle. Okay, so this is this is the picture of how the, that magnetic field line motion maps onto the ionosphere, maps onto the lower boundary of the magnetosphere, uh, and these two cells, which are basically created by the motion from noon side to night side reconnection, and then. Uh, the return flow, this is known as the convection flow, two sort of cells here. Um, and as we saw over here, where you have that current, you also have a, an electric field. So there's actually an electric field that goes along with this motion. This motion is V and then B is going straight down. So the electric field is pointing from B to A. I think it's a little easier to see it here. Uh, there. And here are your field aligned currents. They come down into A and then back out along B. So there's a current that flows from A to B. I, I guess I got the, the sign wrong. And so you can actually integrate that electric field and that gives you the cross polar cap potential. And remember this whole thing was created by the need to reconnect fields on the day side, bring them around to the night side and then reconnect them again to close the cycle. So this cross, this cross polar cap potential is a, is a measure of how fast that reconnection is going. Okay, And if you put in the numbers here, we get about a 50 gigavolt, which if you want to get back out of MKS, which I always do, 5 times 10 to the 12 Maxwells per second. Remember the polar cap potential was about 10 to the 17. So this is going to be about uh, five hours, right? Like a, a portion, a fraction of a day, a sixth of a day or so. Uh, and that's that's how long that doesn't that's how long actually it takes this this little cycle to go on. So that's a sort of overall overview of of the uh, oh just on time of the magnetosphere and the ionosphere. So just to summarize here, and then I can answer any questions. Uh, the ionosphere itself is created by the extreme ultraviolet and x-rays that are created by the sun's corona. 
Uh, they diminished during the night. We saw that I've, I've left out a lot of details. Uh, we'll have experts come along to fill in those details to fix anything that I've said wrong. But basically, the sun's out during the day. It's ionizing things. And then at night, by and large, the sun has gone away. And, and we sort of have to, uh, the, the rate at which that production is going on is low, slowing down. Uh, the solar wind is deflected by the conductors in unmagnetized planets. But in magnetized planets, the solar wind actually doesn't even make it to there. It's deflected by the magnetosphere. But the magnetosphere is connected to the planet only through the ionosphere. Right? That's the last place that it sees a conductor. And so that's the last electrically conducting piece last going down that the magnetic field and the solar wind and the magnetosphere are all going to interact with. And that we can see that that's where the, the motions that are being created in the solar wind sort of are imprinted. OK, I think we'll have half an hour. And then we'll start hearing talks from you. Any questions on the whole core, all the little pieces that we've tried to assemble? OK. Well, then let's give ourselves a little break. And then Nick will tell you how he's going to run this presentation section at starting at 1030. How many talks do we have? OK. Very good. See you after lunch. 12 talks.